I'm really excited to talk to you. I was just texting with my buddy, Nora Lawson. I was like, that's who I'm talking to. Uh, that's nice. Today. She's like, you should tell her we're besties. Yeah. Um, she had such an amazing time with you guys in Atlanta making um, Jerry and Marge. It's so funny because I had just wrapped uh, a feature and literally we crossed each other by one day in Atlanta. So we wow. like had like we're passing ships. Yeah, it was really <laughs> funny. So before I jump in and get started, yeah, yeah. this is a labor of love I began three years ago now. I wanted to create a space where producer to producer, I could help sort of create time capsules of our journeys to help mm. others navigating the path because I learned that there is no one path and that everybody has a slightly different story and navigating my own journey was always so scary and um, lonely, especially when uh, most of my career, I was a freelance producer. So, you know, I started to realize a lot of these conversations I was having with other producer friends off mic about the realities, the frustration, the unglamorous side of what we do, AKA the real job. Right. And I think so many people only see the, the 1% of times where there's, premieres or parties and they yeah. think that that's what producing is and so I started on this mission to one selfishly understand what these other jobs did um, how producers differ across the industry but to really understand how women specifically mm -hmm. have navigated um, this really challenging industry that is you know relentless and it doesn't matter how high you climb, it, it doesn't get any easier. So, and, and I, I think it's because I don't want to dissuade anyone listening from joining us on this crazy ride, but I want them to enter it from a place of knowledge and knowledge that I wish I had when I was starting yeah. out. I love that. I love that. It only happens because people like yourself take the time out of your day to come and talk to me. So thank you so much for being oh, here. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So I always like to start at the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. and with you specifically, since you grew up in, in entertainment biz, you're mm -hmm. kind of from LA. When you first kind of discovered that entertainment was a field that you specifically wanted to be in and your pathway into what you thought a producer was um, and eventually discovering what it actually was for yourself. Oh yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. So I did grow up in LA. Um, my father was an actor, successful actor, television mm -hmm. actor. Um, so I grew up around production. I grew up around sets. Um, and as some of your uh, audience may or may not know, my father was the actor, Tom Bosley, who was Mr. C on Happy Days. Yes. And so it was a very unique production experience because it was, it was my dad's office for, you know, 11 and a half years. And, yeah. but it was very familiar and very, um, it was sort of a comforting home away from home because it, it was over a decade of my young life. And um, I had inherited, so I, I had a feel for production, for physical production. I also inherited my father's love of movies, particularly old movies. I was sort of obsessed with movie musicals from the forties and the fifties. And, um, and, you know, I think that he was, he wasn't quite as avant-garde a movie consumer as the seventies were, but I certainly discovered those films as I got older. And, but my love of movies came from him because we would just watch them together and he would talk about them and he would talk about what they meant to him when he was growing up. So um, I sort of, I, the only thing I knew I didn't want to do is be an actor. I was really clear about that. I didn't want to be an actor. And I had this vague passion for movies, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I ended up mm. going to Georgetown university really as much to get as far away from LA as I could. Um, <laughs> and I was an English major. I wanted a liberal arts experience and I didn't really want to specialize yet. And, um, and I was a, um, I was doing all this work for an English, a degree in, in English. And I worked on Capitol Hill and I came home and I would work in law firms for the summer thinking, Oh, maybe I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll go to law school. And somewhere I believe in my sophomore, junior year, I worked for a lawyer that was a tax lawyer and it was so unbearably boring. 
that um, <laughs> I just realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I kind of had this epiphany that what I really wanted to do was pursue what I loved, which was movies. Yeah. Um, so after I graduated, unbeknownst to me, I was coming out of college into an entertainment space that was in the throes of a very protracted and difficult writer strike, um, mm -hmm. which was 1988. And, um, and I just, I, you know, I didn't know, even though I grew up around the business, I didn't know per se what producers did. I didn't know the difference between what a creative producer is versus more of a line producer, which is more invested in the physical execution of the film. Um, and it was real tri really trial by error. You know, I, I, took, I did a couple of internships. I worked as a temp assistant at a temp agency. And ultimately, I landed working for a producer for about a year, a producer named uh, John Hyde, who was partnered with Gene Kirkwood at the time, mm -hmm. um, and had that experience and thought, you know, I'm not sure... I'm still not sure where I want to be or who I want to be, but I know I want to keep learning more about the business. So I ended up as an assistant at creative artist agency in 1990. Mm -hmm. And that was the first um, sort of moment that I was clear that there was a path forward that was really invested in creative development and production as opposed to as opposed to the physical production where you go from movie to movie to movie i really wanted because as an english major and having read and and done critical analysis of text for 4 years i really loved that and found that there was a path toward that by virtue of being at an agency where there was so much information coming in and going out um and you were always hearing about jobs and you were always hearing about you know what a, what a director of development did and what a creative executive did and, you know, who were the junior executives at studios and, you know, how those people uh, were able to access material and how the producer deals worked. So it was a great um, education about mm -hmm. the business. So, you know, I, I always say that one of the funny things is that I grew up in the business and I still didn't really know. It's crazy. None of my, none of my relationships really affected my trajectory. I think I got out of all of the relationships that I had through the happy days family. I think, um, I had, I got one job as a PA on an imagined television, uh, pilot. That was it, you know? So, um, so it was really a little bit of trial and error and just kind of keeping my eye on what was out there what everything looked like, but also being really clear into in, internally on what I did and didn't want to do. You know, I could mm -hmm. have stayed and been an agent. I could have gone into the training program. I didn't want to do it. And so that was the other thing early on is that I kept just staying in touch with my love of movies and the, the feeling I got when I went into a movie theater. Um, and that kind of kept me as a guide until I was able to land in a job that satisfied that itch, I think. Yeah. How long do you feel like it took you from when you, you started at CAA to when you felt like, I now understand what, how this industry functions a bit. I mean, of course it's always changing. We're always growing, but you know, when you felt like, all right, I feel like I have a grasp on this. And like you said, you identified, I know what I don't want and what I do want. And you see the paths to, towards what you want. Sure. Um, well, I, I think it takes about a year, especially when mm -hmm. you're young. I don't really see it. I mean, there's some instances rarely where somebody can sort of catapult after a few months into the next level. Um, I would say that within three to four months, I was comfortable with the names and the players and who did what at every studio and who did what within inside the agency. But it took me a solid year. Um, and I had promised my boss that I would give him a year, you know. Yeah. Um, so and I think that's important. I think that even if you don't like it, which I didn't, I mean, I knew within a month that this was just a job that I had no interest in. 
long term as being in the representation, even though you don't like it, you're learning so much in the job you don't like because it's not a forever commitment. It's just right. um this is what I'm doing right now. And what can I get out of this experience that will allow me to move forward? And it was because I made an effort to get to know everybody that Jay was my, that my boss was an agent, late Jay, late agent named Jay Maloney passed away several years ago, but um, Mm -hmm. because Jay was this very gregarious, um, engaging personality, and he had so many friends, and he wasn't that much older than me. He was five years older than me. Um, I was able to get to know the people that he talked to all the time. And that's how I got to know people who, when I was ready to leave the agency, they reached out and said, oh, are you interested in coming to work for us? So even though the job itself was not on a path towards something I wanted, the opportunity that the job presented created new pathways for me to pursue. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that you make. I talk a lot about on the show that because there's no one one way to do anything, that whatever hand you are dealt, right, that the best thing you can do is lean in to what is there and make the best of that opportunity, even if it isn't exactly how you imagine it at that moment, because right. you don't know what doors are going to open. And especially if you're starting out and you're still kind of unsure, you may discover that there's a whole career path that you never knew existed mm-hmm. by sheer by sheer value of you being in a job you didn't want to be in the first place. And maybe that's that's the door, right. That opens to where you want to be. Yeah, that's so true. And it's well put. And you know, the one caveat I would put to that is you don't need to stay in a situation that's abusive, right? Yes. You know, if you're being treated poorly, get out and there's always something else. But, um, you know, I didn't know what, what a studio executive did until I went to CAA and got exposed to that. I knew what producers did. I knew what a, a, what a television set looked like and therefore what a movie set looked like. But I, and then I knew what the inside of an agency looked like because I was working for one, but I really didn't know um, how studios functioned and how there was a creative component to the studio system, which mm. is what the next step of my career was. It that, And that was had I not gone to CAA and stayed in a job that I didn't really care about or care for, I never would have learned that. So um, there's no wasted time in a business that is weirdly very small because the ecosystem of what we do is so interrelated. Even if you're not happy in a situation, you're really only a few degrees of separation from something else that you might be really happy in. Yes. And to that note, like, which is why I stress the importance of showing up and doing everything from a place of authenticity and integrity because it is so small and you don't know who's paying attention and what you're going to be remembered for. Like, yes, we all have bad days. We're all humans. But the way you're going to navigate those early days in your journey um, really set the stage for how you're going to be known and how people are going to talk about you when you're not in the room, you know, which is where, unfortunately, for as much as there's so many great like tracking boards and job postings, websites, there's still so much of this industry that is so word of mouth because it moves so quickly oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And you just want people you trust vetting other people because you don't have time to do all of that background uh, check on a lot of people. So, you know, I share that because I've had experiences in my career where I was a of a lower, you know, ranking in a, in a, in a team. And years later had producers reach out to me wanting to hire certain people that I, they had seen through IMDb that I had worked with. And I had told them my experience of those people when I was a nobody and they didn't think I was watching. Right. And there are people who lost job opportunities yeah. because of how they presented themselves in this one job where maybe me being around and seeing that attitude to them at that time was inconsequential, but Indeed, it does have consequences, right? So there's a lot of that that happens behind the scenes. And so I think if you're just navigating it from a place of honesty and transparency, then you'll be fine, you know? You're so right. With Hollywood and everybody always says it's such a tough business and everybody's it's so cutthroat and everybody just wants to, 
you know, step on someone else. It's like, yeah, absolutely. Those people exist, but you can make the choice of how you want to navigate and which part, which circles you want to be a part of, you know? Yeah. And I, I love what you just said about, I mean, it, it really is something I talk about with people who are younger in the business that are, you know, when we talk, with, whether they're working with me or they just call me for advice, authenticity is key. And I have been in this business now long enough to know that the people who tend to flame out fast are the people who are pretending to be something that they're not or acting a way they think they're supposed to be acting in order to get ahead, male and female. Right. And um, you really have to remember why you're doing what you're doing. This is a business that is so, it is a business and it is so hard that if you yeah. can't love the process in some way, right? You don't have to love the long hours and, you know, all the things that go along with, you know, so many no's and everything like that. But you have to be authentic and in, and in tune with why you're doing it. If you can stay in touch with that, you're already ahead of the game because there's so many people around you that are acting the way they think they're supposed to be acting or doing things that they're, they think they're supposed to be doing. And you're right. It's, I, I say this all the time. It takes so much less energy to be decent. You don't have to be friends to everybody. You just need to be decent. You just need to behave decently. That doesn't mean that you can't be disciplined or discipline others or have expectations and express your frustration if something's not going the way you want it to. But decency will get you a lot further in this business than acting out in some way or acquiescing a lot because you yeah. think, well, if I just endear myself to the people they'll like me more and therefore, you know, they'll promote me or they'll give me that job opportunity or whatever it is. So um, I think it's really key. And I don't think enough people hear it. The last thing I will say on this point, I think that the human interaction component is so important and cannot be dis discounted. And, you know, we've obviously just come off of two years of this, right? And this yeah. is here to stay. I mean, there's no question I still have a big piece of my day, which we used to be writer meetings where they would drive across the city or we would meet somewhere. And now when I need to have a writer meeting, I do it this way. But the person to person, in-person contact is so important because that is how you get to know someone. And so the tracking boards and all that stuff, it's all great. But making those real relationships, I have friends that I've been people I've been friends with for 30 years in the business yeah. because we all started together. We all were in it together. We all came up together and we all try to look out for each other. Now, as we enter a new phase of the business, we enter a new phase of our careers. So that is really important. And that is not something you can do virtually. You have to be able to have that interaction. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of conversation now, like if you're a writer, you don't have to live in LA anymore. And there's certain right. jobs where you don't have to be in LA physically. And I, to some extent, I agree. But I do think that the, the, the tax that you pay for getting to be in LA and having the accessibility to run into someone in a coffee shop, to go to a birthday party and have, like you said, those human connections yeah. that lend themselves to getting hired to right. job opportunities. Like you're just not going to get that if you're in Des Moines, Iowa or wherever you're absolutely be. right. And that is the downside of it. But unfortunately, like we said earlier, it moves so quickly, mm -hmm. but also we want to invest in people that we feel good around that are yeah. obviously can do the work, but also are just good people. And you are not going to have that touch point if the only experience you have of someone is this remote thing. And if it's only through talking about the work, right, there's all the humanity that makes you the kind of artist and collaborator that you are. That is frankly the most exciting part of getting to know someone mm -hmm. in this business and That's and right. why little pods and clicks of people get formed and those are the the teams that rise up and we hear about. So, you know, I get this question all the time um, of people wondering if they should move here and and you know, I, I think everybody's got their own life circumstances, of course, but the experience of being in LA, I've now been here for 16 years, is invaluable and frankly you know, I've had for the past five years, a lot of highlight reels of my career, but there have been, a, there's been a decade of a lot of hustle and a lot of grinding it out and meeting people and laying that foundation to now be in this stage of my career. 
which is another part of the process that a lot of people don't talk about because we love to romanticize the the overnight sensations yeah. and all of that stuff across every discipline of our business. Yeah. And I'm here to remind people that it just takes the time that it takes. If you're consistent, like you will get where you want to go. If you're consistent and a good person and you're good at what you do, that's that's it. There's no yes. other secret. <laughs> really, there isn't. It's really true. And I've looked for all the shortcuts, I promise you. No, there are no shortcuts. And you know, no. um, the other thing too is it can be a very lonely business. And to be able to have the cohort of people around you that really understand yeah. your experience because they're going through it too, I think that's critical. I don't think that anyone can build a career alone in this business. Yeah. And it does take time and there are no shortcuts and I don't care. And, you know, I talk about this all the time with my husband. It's like, you, you see the shiny person over there that's suddenly getting a lot of attention. And the reality is all that matters when you are a producer, truly all that matters is if you develop good material and you can get that material. If you have good material, people are going to want to work with you. And honing your taste and reading and watching movies and not just watching movies on the screen in at home, going into a movie theater and feeling what that movie feels like, understanding what the audience is getting from it and talking about it with your peers and saying like, you know, did you read that script? Did you like that script? Oh, I read that. I loved it. Or all of that stuff is it's enriching and it helps you on the journey so that you aren't alone doing it. And I do think um, as you in, ta- in sort of the, the, the intention of one of the intentions of this podcast, I do think that men are better at it than women. And it's something that um, I have learned the hard way. And hmm, interesting, which part of it? I think that women are not as inherently comfortable with actively soliciting help from each other and or offering help to each other. Whereas men in this business and in most businesses culturally, psychologically have been trained or ingrained to expect that from each other, right? Mm. That it's like, oh, I need help. I'm going to call my, oh, we're going to go play around to golf or, oh, we're going to whatever, you know, the thing is of the moment. Whereas women have really had to fight so hard for their place in this, in the world of what we do, that sometimes it's uncomfortable to say to another woman, can you help me? I need help. I'm having a tough time or I'm, I'm trying to figure this out or, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't get the job and I really need a job. And can you help me find the next opportunity and being very overt about it. And I also think it's been a function of so many women have fought so hard to be at the table. Right. That, and it's not conscious. I don't know one woman that doesn't want to be supportive of her sisters, but there is this unconscious thing of like, I got to look out for me because there's so many more men in the room than me. It's something that I've really been conscious more of in the last decade in, in terms of the existence of it, but also that it's slowly starting to crack. It's slowly yeah. starting to melt that women are finally getting comfortable reaching out to each other and saying, okay, how can we help each other? How can, what do you need? You know, oh, you didn't get that job. Oh, oh, you want that job. Let me see if I know somebody there. Oh, you, yeah. you, know, you want access to that actor or that director? Absolutely. I'm happy to make an introduction. That is slowly beginning to turn. And I hope that women will be get, will continue to be comfortable in that because yeah, it's not, it's not a zero sum game. You know, it's not like, well, if I have, if I have, if I'm employed, you can't be, that's not, that's not right. the world we live in. Yeah. Well, I think as we reach, you know, through gender parity and in, in the workplace, we can start to undo that psychological trauma, frankly, mm-hmm. of having to always be the only woman in the room and having to step on other women to get where you're going, not because you don't care about them, but because there's only been one spot for so long. Yeah, right. And we are, I think, in the, in a season of transition, because I think with my generation, you know, I'm in my 30s, like, I already sense that and feel that from women a little older than me and the women coming up, there's a lot more vulnerability in reaching out and asking for help and asking for support in ways that I, I too fell into that trap of like, 
especially when there's no textbook for what we do and you'd want to, you know, be perceived as someone who knows what you're talking about and know what you're doing. And if you're lucky enough to have a mentor to get into places where you can ask all the stupid questions and actually get the the Mm -hmm. answers you need to feel empowered, you know, but there's so much fear. I think there's specifically in Hollywood, it feels like an industry so built on fear, which is ironic because we're creating art, right? At the end of the day, yes, it's commerce and art, but we are telling stories and the best stories are really told from a place of love. So it's interesting Mm -hmm. how the birth of this industry came from that place. And I feel like we're in a transition, not to say it's not going to be hard just because there's like love in the mix, you know, but I do, I do feel this shift and I feel specifically for me, you know, I went in house about a year ago to Issa Rae's Color Creative, and mm-hmm. it's my first time getting to do this. And it's very exciting, but also very scary, right? And mm-hmm. there's a, a massive community of women, specifically in the physical production space that I'm a part of, who have years and years of experience on me, who are like, anything you need, I got you. Like, yeah. you just let me know how I can support you. And it's unbelievable to be able to tap into a network of experiences and perspectives that I'll never have on my own because I haven't right. lived all of those lives. You know, yeah. it's invaluable. And I see that happening more and more. And I, I find it truly, truly beautiful. And I hope that the generation coming up under me is able to really keep that up and ingrain that from a much younger age too, in, in our fellow sisters so that it doesn't have to cost so much, you know, to be vulnerable, that indeed it is an asset that we have as women to be able to share that and and grow from that place. I love that. And and I love Color Creative. It's such a, it's such a great company with a great mission. And yeah, you know, I, I think the other thing too, is to your point about women that are coming up in the business And one of the things, I have a 20-year-old son and a 24-year-old son, and they are of this sort of Gen Z group that wants to just change the world. And I love that. But there also is a wisdom to the women who and the men, the people who have come before you in this business. And um, I don't think that I'm going to burn it all down is is the right approach either. And I think that, as you say, there is something really valuable intergenerationally for women and men, but women also in particular, to share what they've been through, because there is a wisdom in that. And, you know, I I look at the women who are even 10 years older than me, and I'm amazed at how they navigated the world, because, you know, I at least was in a situation when I started coming up in the business where there were a lot of women around me I could look to and say like, oh, look, there's, you know, Lucy Fisher, who's a senior executive at at Warner Brothers. And, you know, oh, look, there's Amy Pascal and Stacey Snyder. And, you know, Don Steele at that point had been, had become a producer, but there were senior <laughs> women agents. And, but those women, when they were coming up and they were coming up maybe five, six years ahead of me, there were no women. Like that's, <laughs> they were looking around and they didn't see themselves anywhere. And they were trying to figure out like, how am I going to do this? And they had to navigate a world that didn't accommodate them. They had to play by those rules. And then once they got in there, they could work to get the rules changed. So yeah, there is a, a healthy balance of taking in the experience of the people that paved the way for you and then adapting that to say, okay, I got that. And now I'm going to fight to make it better and change it and evolve it and do all those things. Yeah. I feel like it's like brick by brick, right? We've been building a bridge, but women who've come before us use whatever tools they had at the time. And, and now we can go and repave some of those roads with some fresh coat of paint and whatnot and make the path a little bit easier to navigate. But it, it took those initial bricks being placed for us to even build that bridge. And that can never be forgotten. And I think it's part of what this podcast has turned into is really if all these women die and don't write books and all these people who've come before us don't like the only book I've ever read was like, so you want to be a producer by Lawrence Turner. You know what I mean? Like what other book like there, and, and yes, there's a few others that have been written by women, but like 20 years ago. Right. So unless every woman gets to write her memoir, who's walked this path, how do we learn from each other? Um, and I, I become secretly obsessed with this very thing of these like little time capsules that others can discover at whatever point in their journey. And hopefully it'll inform where they're going because it 
think yeah. it, that's that's what it's about. I think it's so great. I think it's it's so smart and so great. And you're absolutely right that there's generations of wisdom that hasn't been captured. And yeah. it's important that it's important that you do. I think it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So back to you and CAA. So then you go to Sony. Yes. And then you're there for 17 years. Yes. Which is a very long time. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, the, the opportunity at Sony came as a direct result of my work at CAA because Stacy Snyder and Jay Maloney were very close friends and Stacy had just started working at Sony. Um, it was right when John Peters and Peter Goober had been installed as the co-chairman of the studio. Um, so she had moved, she worked for them at, as producers and she moved over there. And I had talked to Stacy every day because Stacy called to speak to Jay and Jay was busy and I would talk to her and um, she hired me and I started in June of 1990 and um, my original job was creative executive, no, story editor at Goober Peters Entertainment, which was set up as like this tiny little company within Sony. So what was fun about that was um, it was sort of this oasis of like a production company within a big corporate scenario. So I really um, learned how to write notes, how to make lists. I really sort of carved my teeth on essence, the foundation of development in that job. And one of the pieces of wisdom that Stacy had given to me that I, to this day, say to anyone that I hire is, you will be invited to everything we do and you will get an invitation to nothing. So if you want to be involved, it's on you to get yourself involved. So what I would do was at the end of every week, I'd go to her assistant. I'd say, what's her schedule for next week? I would look at her schedule. I'd say, can I join that? Can I join that? I want to be a part of that. And, you know, nine times out of 10, she would say, yes, there were very few situations where she would say, no, I need to do this alone. But by virtue of doing that, I got myself in the room and there were lunches I got to attend with agents that I normally never would have met at that stage. And that was how I started to watch and learn and listen and hear how she spoke to writers and hear how she spoke to directors and hear how she dealt with agents. So it was a great, great foundational learning experience. And um, within two years, they had decided to merge Goober Peters Entertainment into TriStar Pictures, which was, there were two studio labels that Sony owned at the time, mm -hmm. um, active labels. And so um, I went from two years at Goober Peters to what became over five years at TriStar Pictures. And that was much more of a real studio experience unlike Goober Peters, which was sort of this little pet company. And then after five, six years at TriStar, we merged, they decided to shut down TriStar and we merged into Columbia Pictures. And I was at Columbia for almost eight years. So I don't even know if that math hand adds up, it's approximate, but that was basically what happened. So I was at Sony for 17 years, but I was at three very distinct companies in terms of what, what the... Um, the mission was in terms of what the culture was. They were very, very distinct companies. Um, and I got something out of all of them. And the other reason why I chose to stay as long as, there were two reasons why I chose to stay. Number one is a studio executive. Um, you rarely get credits on movies. I mean, there are very few exceptions. Um, you know, New Line and Miramax were two companies that, have typically given executive producer credit on screen to the executives who work on the movies. And I, I actually just saw recently, I, I went last weekend to see Elvis and I noticed that um, Warner Brothers gave executive producer credit to three of the executives who worked on the movie, but it's very, it's very much the exception, not the rule. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my currency as a professional were, was my projects. So if I just decided to sort of 
hopscotch to the next job that might pay me more money or might have been a bigger title, I would have to start all over again. And my currency was my slate of projects. And as they started to get made and became successful movies, that spoke to who I was as a creative person. So I I stayed, I always chose my projects over the next shiny toy. That was number one. Number two was um, I very much wanted to be a mother and um, I didn't want to have children and be on location. And I also didn't want to start a new job and then suddenly have to worry about if I could get pregnant or not, or if I should get pregnant or not. And that was a big decision. It was, they were very supportive as a company. I was surrounded by people who also had children, you know, Lucy Fisher, who at that point was now vice chairman of the studio was one of the women who really um, uh, made headway in maternity leave. And when she was at Warner brothers, she had had, uh, she, she got them to build a child daycare facility, which nobody had had at the time. Wow. Um, she also only worked four days a week. You know, she, one of the things she was able to get was to say, look, I'll be here Monday through Thursday, but I've got three kids. She had children later and she had three kids within like four or five years. And she just said, I, I, I'm not working on, on Fridays. And so she was really a trailblazer in that way. And, and she gave me the next sort of piece of wisdom that I carry with me, which was, um, you know, when you become a parent, you don't, don't ever use it as an excuse, but don't ever ask permission. So you don't, you don't have to ask for permission to drive your kids to school or to go to their, you know, back to school night or whatever the case may be, but you also can't use it as an excuse. You can't say, oh, I can't do that meeting because of my kids. Like, don't go down that road because that's the thing that stigmatizes, certainly at the time, that stigmatizes women as, well, they can't because she's like, you know, that the handicap is she's pregnant or she's nursing or she's whatever the case may be. And I thought that was really helpful because, I just was, right? I just would say, um, I, I absolutely will be a part of that um, that meeting. And then I arranged my life that way. And Or I would say, go ahead and do the meeting without me. I won't be there. I didn't make a big deal about it. I didn't sort of like, like get anxious about it. I just, I just did it. But I didn't ask for permission to go to, you know, transition at nursery school with my kids, I was going to do it. And if I missed the meeting as a result of it, okay. But I knew they weren't going to fire me for it. And, um, and I thought it was really helpful. I mean, I think things have evolved in some ways. And I think, you know, certainly the notion of family leave has become much more ingrained in our culture, which is great. Yeah. You know, some places still see uh, maternity leave is part disability, which is mind boggling to me. Crazy. It's I mean, crazy. I, that was how I did my maternity leave. It was six weeks disability and six weeks vacation that I had accrued. I was going to bring that up because there's a great quote that, you know, I pulled where you talk about this experience of having both of your sons while you were there. And, and really it was your ability to have six weeks of disability and six weeks of vacation. That was your your maternity leave. Yeah. And I, the idea of even calling a pregnancy a disability, which is a whole separate podcast, especially in light of the recent <laughs> news is like a whole thing. But you know, I, the, the thing that really struck out to me is when you say, you know, you professionally plateaued once you had your kids, you had your first mm-hmm. son at 31. Then four years later, you had your second son, you became an executive VP at 31. And at 41, you were still an EVP. Yet yeah. the men around you went from being VPs to senior VPs, exec VPs, to two of them being president. And you said, you know, I had a lot of feelings about that, but I also loved my job and was grateful for the opportunity. There was no one to articulate that too. Mm. And, you know, reading that is is painful for me mm-hmm. on your behalf, you know, that, that this was the experience you had to have. And that while there's been progress made almost 20 years later, I, I don't think we are too far still from that, yeah. you know, that there's still so much more to go. And a lot of the people who listen are entering that stage of their lives as well, where they are working professional women who are entering motherhood or considering motherhood. And how do you structure your life to do that when, you know, you've spent 
most of your energy perhaps on your career being career focused because you love what you do mm-hmm. and then this is this is some of the realities that you have to contend with if you want to still be a working uh, parent so I would just love for you to talk a little bit on that oh for sure um you know one of the things first of all I say to everyone who will listen to me if you want to be a parent be a parent it's the greatest if, if it's something that speaks to you and you want it, you want a family, you must do it. And there's, there's nothing, there's no career, there's nothing that can and should get in the way of that. Um, I also say that you cannot be a working mother and be anywhere 100% of the time, you could be 100% in your work that day, and 0% with your kids, you can be 50 50, you can be 80 20, but you can't be 100 100. And so, and it's just, it's just a a, an existential reality. This isn't a function of me saying like, don't pay attention to your kids or don't pay attention to your work. I think that you can absolutely set boundaries. I think, which I did. I think you can absolutely um, make rules about what you will and won't do. And if your employer is not supportive of that, find another employer because there are plenty at this stage now who will support that. So I tell everybody, don't, not have children because you're terrified of what it will do to your career. But I also am honest about the fact that um, it will have an impact and it doesn't mean it's a negative impact. It just, it's an, it's an is, it's not a negative or a positive. Mm. It is um, it, you can't do two things. You can't be two people at the exact same time. Right. So for me, one of the sort of fascinating conundrums was I never wanted to be president of production at Sony ever. And so the disappointment wasn't, um, oh gosh, I've lobbied for that job for so long and I can't believe Matt Tolmec and Doug Belgrad got it. I mean, Matt and Doug are, are dear old friends and we were great colleagues and, um, you know, I, I didn't, feel anything negative toward them. They were also really good dads. They're both very devoted dads. And um, so the conundrum was I never really wanted that job. But what the message was, particularly considering that in that space of time, I had had very, very successful films in cumulatively. And, you know, I could distill it down to when they got promoted Doug had Men in Black 2 at the time. Matt had Spider-Man and I had a baby. (laughs) And, you know, and so what happened was when Amy Pascal was looking to restructure the division, the department, and wanted someone in those jobs, I don't begrudge her. Number one, it really did take two people to do that particular job in that particular circumstance. But number two, I understood why she made that decision. It was just, it felt somehow like, huh, all of this other stuff that I've accumulated professionally, and yet I'm not sure what it adds up to. So it wasn't that I wanted the job and didn't get it, or that I got really mad and wanted to leave because I didn't get it. It was just sort of being confronted with the reality of there may be something else in the mix that is out of my control because of the decisions that I made. And, you know, there aren't many examples of women in heads of studio positions or heads of um, networks or things like that who had children early in their career, and it didn't slow them down. Mm. You know, in most instances, and I'm thinking of, you know, Lucy Fisher was an executive vice president when she had her kids. And then she plateaued and she plateaued by choice. And then when her girls were older, then she became vice chairman of Sony Pictures. But Stacey Snyder didn't have, um, she had her first child after she was already president of production. You know, Donna Langley, had her first child after she was president of production. Emma Watts, she had 
at least one of her kids, but then, you know, once she was in the president production position, had more children. So yeah, that isn't by accident. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah, for sure. it's not, it's not a function of, um, of, oh, it's how I plotted it, but it's really about sort of like thinking about how you want to navigate this stuff. So, so what I did was I, um, reconstituted how I saw myself in the job. And I said to myself, okay, if I am, uh, if I am going to be the EVP when they're the co-presidents, but I'm going to be so closely aligned with them, then I'm going to be their EVP. And I'm going to be the number one EVP at the studio working on all the most important movies with all the most important filmmakers. And I'm going to sort of make sure that I am their right hand doing everything that they can't do because now they're in a different job. Mm -hmm. And so by virtue of doing that, I, I sort of dove into building my relationships with certain filmmakers, building my relationship with certain talent, you know, making sure that I had a really good relationship with Nancy Myers and with Will Smith, who was at the time, you know, massively successful and, you know, working with Jim Brooks and working with Steve Zalian and working with um, Peter Morgan when he, when he wrote um, the other Boleyn girl for us. And so those were, I just decided like, okay, by association, I'm going to be perceived as important to the process and I'm going to do everything I can to lean into that, which is what I yeah. did. Well, it's what you've been doing, right? This is the theme yes. of this episode in many yes. ways. It's you're making the best out of that situation instead of begrudgingly uh, being in that space. Correct. And what ended up happening was I got a bigger job. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and and that's the irony of it, right? Is that um, I, it's sort of like the the Lucy Fisher journey. It's like, So I did that. Um, I think they got promoted in 2003 or four, probably three. I did that probably for four or five years in that scenario. And then I got offered a bigger job. And that bigger job was CBS Films. And that job, I was running everything. Every single department reported to me. And, um, And it was, you know, I was in charge of, production and post-production and marketing and distribution. And, um, and I was starting something from scratch. It was a new business, a new system. So in biding my time and using it to build my relationships, it was, yes, it was hard, but it was also a, a, a gut check. And yeah. was it that I just was upset because I didn't want the job? Or because I wanted the job or was I upset because it was just kind of like, oh, I, you know, I had all the success and somehow it wasn't recognized. And what I realized was I never really wanted that job. So I had to figure out what it was I loved about what I was doing. And being in the EVP at a studio, I still think to this day is the best job out there because you get to do all the creative stuff and you have a lot of of sort of independence, but you don't have any of the headache of running a studio. (laughs) Noted. Yes, for sure. So, um, you know, it just, the perspective shift was important. And the reality was I wanted to be a mom. That is as much a part of who I am as anything else I've accomplished. And that was sort of the price of admission and it's worth it. I mean, I, in the long run, it's absolutely worth it. Would I, you know, I might have been worth more money or made more money in the long run if, or had a bigger, even bigger titles or who knows if I had not done it that way, but I, it goes back to also to authenticity. I couldn't go after, I couldn't pursue a job that I didn't really want. It just didn't, it just was not who I was. And I'm sure there are many people out there that do it because they think, okay, I've been an EVP for this long. And I guess that the next thing is I'm supposed to be doing is I'm supposed to want to be the president in production. And, you know, it also was fascinating because I left Sony at a moment where the industry was just about to change. And had I not left when I left, I probably wouldn't be able to be doing what I'm doing right now because it really catapulted me into a different 
modality that forced me to think differently and forced me to deal with headwinds in our business Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had to deal with if I had still been in that studio. And that's when you struck out on your own and you decided to launch Get In Media Media, and then eventually Landline Pictures, which brings us to (laughs) today-ish. Well, talk a little bit about that, like, you know, being in such a stable perception of stability, right, at a studio, a corporate job, and then going out on your own. Um, What were some of the biggest obstacles with that decision and then the transition for you into the, this new chapter? Sure. Um, I have often said, uh, I, and I, I, I joke about it now, that I think I've cornered the market and being an expert in launching new businesses in times of socioeconomic upheaval. Because when I got to, <laughs> um, when I got to CBS, it was October of 2007, the writers struck in November, the actors struck in February of 2008, and then the economy crashed in September of 2008. So, I mean, I literally, it was me and one other person and I had to start from scratch. And I, the first year of being there, the world imploded. Like, you know, the business as we know it was starting to change. You know, it was the beginning of Facebook. It was the beginning, the beginning of Hulu. It was the beginning of, of Netflix. Correct. So everything yeah. was changing. And um, and I literally couldn't commission a script because of the writer's strike. And I couldn't even make an existing package because of the actor's strike. Like I could have a, a, a ready-made package and, you know, not do any work on the script. And I still couldn't employ the actors. So, and then the economics of the business changed. So um, I learned how to pivot pretty quickly on a business model by virtue of all of those things coming at me. And, you know, a lot of what happens in the life cycle of a new business is luck and you get lucky early. And we had started right at the same time that Summit launched. And um, they were probably six months ahead of us. And the luck that they had, the sort of genie in the bottle that they had was the Twilight books, which they had... Mm you know, and we didn't have the same kind of luck. Like we were literally starting from scratch. We didn't have anything. We didn't have anything to sort of test the system with. Like it was just hard. And, and the expectations of the business kept changing. So after four years of that, um, I, you know, what I would have wanted to stay for and what they wanted it to be were vastly different things. And so I left, I mean, um, my contract was up. They didn't want to renew it. I didn't care because I just was done. Um, and I had looked around and saw that the business was continuing to change at a radical pace. But also, I didn't feel like I felt like I had earned enough credibility, at least in my own head, that I didn't want to be asking studios to buy material for me because I knew what was commercial and I knew I trusted my own sense of my commercial radar. So um, having written so many business plans when I was at CBS, I decided to write one for myself. And I raised a very small amount of development money. And I used that to start to incubate projects and, you know, got two movies made that way. Um, And then was approached in 2019 to launch this label landline for MRC, which focuses on an older audience. And that was um, really interesting to me because it was a, um, it was a space that I really understood. So I, but, you know, I having made movies in that space, but I think that what the most, um, the most sort of daunting piece of it that I'm still so grateful to this day that I left the studio system when I did was I had to develop an entrepreneurial muscle and not rely on having a deal at a studio and, you know, knowing that I would have to start on my own. And even though I start, you know, I started CBS with nothing. I started my own company with nothing. And I started Landline with very little. I mean, I had people that worked for me already because they worked for me at Gidden um, and the MRC guys, I, I work with them and they're great partners, but Um, there really is an entrepreneurial spirit to what the business is right now. And that's about um, 
creating opportunities for yourself. It's about advocating for yourself, which again, I think is something that's hard for women to do. You know, men love to talk about all their accomplishments. It's not something that women are sort of programmed to do as yeah. much. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, at every turn over the last decade, the if there's one word that defines it, it's entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Because you have to just dig in and come up with your mission statement and figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna achieve it. But know that it's the Wild West, which is the good news, right? Everybody's out there. The rules are all out the window and they're changing on a weekly basis. And so you have to use that to your advantage as opposed to being afraid of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I really love to talk about on the show are about the struggles, are about the challenges behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. the ups and downs of this business. I've been very transparent, maybe People are actually sick of me talking about it, but you know, the anxiety and sometimes the depression that comes with self-worth being tied up with the business and how anyone navigates the blows, the constant rejection, the, um, the, the sort of mourning that comes and the grieving that comes over lost relationships, lost projects, mm-hmm. lost so much, right? There's so much downturn. There's always the upswings. And so I am curious how you've navigated that for yourself. And especially coming up, I, you said something in the earlier in the conversation about, you know, how you don't want to necessarily have to be whatever this idea is that people have of how you should be to be in this business, right? It's like, maybe people who watch too much entourage feel like there's a certain way one needs to be, but, right. but it's like, how do you navigate? How have you rather navigated all the ups and downs and still been able to stay anchored in yourself right? Especially when you were younger coming up, there's so many influences, like having that center, having that thing that brings you back to what the why, you know, Mm -hmm. how has that been like for you? Um, It's a great question. And um, I will say that the loneliest I have ever been in the business is when I ran CBS, because those jobs are very hard. And you are one of one when you are in the, that position. And it's very hard to figure out who you can talk to, to express your insecurity or frustration or, um, you know, anxiety or loneliness. And, you know, you're, you're meant to be in control. You're meant to be in charge. And if you try to share that with other people in charge, there's always the risk that they're going to take advantage of that or the fear of the risk of that. Right. I think that one of the things you have to do is realize that nobody is really thinking of you. (laughs) You are the only one thinking of you. And this feeling of, oh my gosh, if that happens to me or, oh, I got fired or, oh, they let me go or, oh, that didn't work out. And I'm so embarrassed. And what's everyone going to say? No one's really thinking about you. They may read about it or they may talk about it for a day. And then the next day they're on to the next thing. And so you're out of the cycle and you have to remember that there's always another thing coming down the pipe that everybody's thinking about or looking at that nobody's really thinking about you. You are thinking about you. And if you can really get your head around that, you still have to sit with your own feelings, but you don't have to pile on top of that. Like, Oh my God, everyone must think I'm a loser or whatever. So um, that's something that I really got my head around really early on. The second thing I got my head around really early on is that I take nothing personal in business. I'm a very sensitive person. So how did you master that? What is the secret? Um, Just understanding that it's business and people say and do things for better and worse. They're not your friends. You know who your friends are. Like the business acquaintances who are trying to get you to make a deal or lure you into doing a job or whatever the case may be, they're not really your friends. They're it's that's transaction. And so when they're mean or when they abandon you or when they um, don't come through or whatever, you know, that when they say yes, and then they actually say, then they turn around and say, no, it's not about you. It's just, it's a business. It's as much a business transaction as the good stuff, right? When they're like, Oh, we love you. We want to be in business with you. So I take nothing personally when it comes to business. And I and and it doesn't mean that I don't take things personally or that I don't get hurt or feel vulnerable. Yeah. But in work, I really try to remember none of this is personal. None of it. It's work. It's business. Um, 
And, you know, in terms of the setbacks, gosh, I wish I, I, I wish I, I had a magic answer for it. The reality is this is a really hard business. 99% of the time it's no. And if you can win the tenacity battle, you are ahead of 95% of everyone else around you. I don't say it to be cute of like, well, if that doesn't feel good to you, this may not be a business for you. I just say it as truth, right? If you if it's hard to tolerate that, it may not be the right creative pursuit as an individual. But if you can you know, I, I I joke that I wish I had taken accounting when I was at Georgetown rather than being an English major because I would have had a portable skill. And, um, <laughs> you know, but I, but I can't imagine doing anything else. And if I can't imagine doing anything else, then the price of admission is I have to tolerate that. Yeah. I do. I have to tolerate it. And you know, I still to this day get super excited. You know, we have a movie in the marketplace right now with Landline. It's our first film, Jerry and Marge Go Large. Yes, which is excellent. It's on, it's on Paramount Plus. On Paramount Plus. And, you know, I still get super excited when I see a TV spot or I see a, a billboard or, you know, we were lucky, even though it's a streaming movie, we were lucky enough to premiere it at Tribeca. So I actually saw it with a real audience and wow, I still get excited about that. And so that's the good stuff you get to participate in when you're yeah. doing this. So um, I think you can't deny it. I think the people that try to deny it are the people that we unfortunately all know, and we know many of them, that sort of indulge in other activities to kind of dull the pain, whether they're you know, <laughs> eating or drinking or gambling or whatever the case may be. If you're trying to avoid what's difficult about this business, you're never going to outrun it. So you have to just accept that it's a difficult business, but you also have to accept that the reason why you're doing it is because you can't imagine doing anything else Yeah. because the, because the end result is the reason why you're doing it to begin with. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So before we move on to the lightning round, we've reached the end of our time together. Um, what is the thing that you love the most about this business? And if there's a legacy that you hope to leave behind, what would you say that oh. is? Well, I think what I love about this business is the creative process is your legacy. I think that they're tied. I think any movie you've worked on, no matter what the capacity you've worked on it, you carry the pride of authorship of that, right? Yeah. So if you were the um, editor on a movie or if you were the production designer on a movie or if you were the studio executive of a movie or if you sold that project that became this great movie – you own that. That's you. You get to say, oh, I was a part of that. And and particularly when there are things that, are, that become beloved in the sort of cultural lexicon, um, you know, I am I am so proud of the fact that I was a part of a movie like Best Friends Wedding or The Holiday or Moneyball. Yeah. Because those are seminal incredible films there. And, and, you know, it, and it takes a village and I can't say, Oh, it was all me, but it was a part of me. And, and my participation in those movies helped get those movies made. So um, I'm really proud of that. And I think that is, I certainly don't do this because I want a legacy, but I think that the legacy is the thing I love the most about it because all of us, working on these movies and and on television shows, the team that gets it made, that gets it done, gets to have the pride of authorship of the fact that it happened at all. And so um, the other piece of it that I love is, I love the uh, the end result when when you hear the feedback of an audience who likes it, you know? And whether it's in a theater or, you know, now with a movie that's on the, uh, this is my first experience with a streaming movie. Um, you know, you read the comments and you're like, oh, they like it. That's so nice. So that to me is, it's like having a baby, right? It's like, it's you're in labor and you're just like, this is the worst yes. thing I've ever experienced. 
And then out the baby comes and you're like, oh, okay, I can do that again. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. That we forget the trauma, the heart production and all Correct. the rejection because the baby's so cute. It's so exactly. cute, right? Exactly. Um, well, congrats on Jerry and Marge Go Thank Large. You I watched much. it this past weekend with my dad and we just loved it. Perfect. It's That's so exactly great. what we wanted. Exactly yeah, what we wanted. Truly. I was like, dad, we have to watch this movie. I'm interviewing the producer and he just, he just loved it. And it was so great to see a film that's just a positive story in the world, you know, about doing good in this, in the, in the world with, um, with a circumstance. It's the uh, reverse of uh, Walt White, you know, if, uh, if, yes. if Walt sh- shows uh, to do good, this is, this is that story in a way. So um, congrats to you. Thank and the you team very again. much. Thank you. Okay. So before we go, we are going to do a quick little lightning round. These are fun five questions that I'd like to end with. I ask every right. guest these questions. So, so here we go. Lightning okay. round. <laughs> What's a song that teleports you to a happy place? Probably uh, uh, Our Lips Are Sealed by the Go-Go's. What is the latest piece of art that moved you? A book, a film, a TV show, etc. cetera. Mm. I'm going to say that the movie Elvis is the most recent piece of art that moved me because I really appreciated the love for the lead character that Baz Luhrmann had. And it really moved me that he cared that much about that performer. And it really moved me how misunderstood he was and how much I misunderstood him. And so Mm -hmm. I really had to rethink my whole perspective on Elvis, particularly later stage Elvis, you know, when it was like the sort of kitschier version of him. But um, I really had a profound experience with that film and I wasn't expecting to. So I would have to say Elvis is probably the most recent one. I love it. That's the best. Okay. Fill in the blank. When I'm overworked, blank helps ease the stress. Watching baseball. When I'm overworked, okay. watching baseball. I'm a Dodgers <laughs> fan. I hard Dodgers fan. So my older son played college baseball, so I was a I was a baseball mom um, for many years. So when I'm feeling overwhelmed, yes, I I I go to our family room and I turn on MLB and I watch whatever's on, but preferably the Dodgers. <laughs> oh, I love that! I love that. Okay, what is one of the most worthwhile investments you've ever made, and it doesn't have to be financial? Oh, oh that's a Great question. Um, I'm going to say it is a fi- it, it is a financial, and I'm going to say it's our home. We've been here for almost 25 years, and um, it's such a sanctuary for us that. Um, and my adult children still live here, so that shows you that they're they're that. never going to leave. Um, <laughs> I have more appreciation for it now than I ever have because we were so lucky to be in it and be safe during the pandemic. Yeah. I would have to say that that is that that is probably the most meaningful, the most meaningful investment that I have made other than my marriage. My marriage is a, is a meaningful investment. Yes. And you're also married to a, a fellow producer, which yes, was a I question am. I wanted to get to on the pros and cons of being married to a producer, producer yes. to producer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, this is the final question. It's a bit of a silly one, but growing up, I loved Inside the Actor's Studio, and I mm. always wished that we had a version of that for producers. Maybe one day we'll have Inside the Producer Studio. But until then, I will borrow the question, the famed question that he asks at the end, uh, which is by the French journalist Ber- Bernard Pivot, and he asks, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Wow. Um. I think I would want to hear you did a really great job balancing your passion for your work and your passion for your family. I think that's what it would be. Yeah. I love that. What a great note to end on. Amy (laughs) Mayer, thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, And I will say one thing on the PS front. um, It's really fun being married to a fellow producer. And it was actually more challenging when I was a studio executive because it was almost prohibited that we were, we were not allowed to work together because my bosses would always say like, correct. 
But now we're actually, after all these years, uh, we've been married almost 29 years. We actually have our Congrats. first project together. Thank you. So wow. That's going to really be a special fun. one. It's really fun. And he's actually extraordinarily um, helpful and smart and helps me navigate situations and vice versa. So for anyone who's worried about it, don't, don't think about it twice. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you're, you're a freaking inspiration across the board. Thank Congrats on everything. Much. Thank you again for taking the time. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was really fun.